Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite parts of electrical engineering, and it's often neglected, usually fine, but oh boy when it's not fine. It's really not fine. We're talking about component thermodynamics. Why is thermo my favorite? Well, thermo's kind of like that teacher or professor standing over your shoulder during the exam, just hoping to find mistakes in your work, usually silent always right and persistent. There's no cheating on the thermo exam of life either. Cutting corners when thinking about thermo is a short road to components blowing up or flying off a PCB. Don't believe me? I'll prove it. This video will introduce the concept of thermodynamics as it applies to components, walk through a design example, and certainly arm you with enough information to be dangerous, even if it's not enough to teach you everything you need to know. The world of thermodynamics is vast. If you've studied mechanical engineering for any appreciable length of time, you would know exactly how complicated thermodynamics can become. Thankfully, I've never had the pleasure of doing that, and thermo is one of those disciplines, in my opinion, where a person can study it for their entire life and still have more to learn. Thankfully, we don't need to understand all or even most of thermodynamics to apply some fundamental theories to our circuits and prevent things from getting too hot or blowing apart. Let's start by laying down the framework. Let's lay down some basic principles and rules that we can use when we're talking about thermodynamics. Heat flows from warm objects to cooler objects. Why? Because there's more energy in a warm object than in a cold object, and systems tend to prefer when everything nearby has an approximately equal energy level. This is the same natural tendency rooted in physics that causes electrons to flow from high potentials to lower potentials. You can never get something colder than the thing you're transferring energy into. Why? Because if you average one, and a, one units of temperature with one and a half units of temperature, you can't get a total temperature of less than one because one plus one and a half is something more than one. We aren't creating or destroying energy here. We're just moving it around or spreading it out. Nobody anywhere in our reality can create or destroy energy. Why? Because physics. This is a fundamental part of our understanding of reality. This law has never been proven wrong, and it has been consistently punishing us with efficiencies never exceeding 100% for thousands of years. Materials transfer energy through them, including heat. This is very similar to how all materials have electrical conductivity. They also have a thermal conductivity. The thicker a material is, the better insulator it is. Some materials are intrinsically better conductors or insulators, but having more thickness will always increase the thermal resistance. This is the same way that metal may be better or worse at conducting electricity when compared to a clay brick. It's just a part of the material itself. So we've laid down a couple ground rules and hopefully those will be useful. Please don't forget those. Especially don't forget the one about creating energy. Over unity is not a thing, okay? You can't get more power out of a system than you put in, okay? It's just not a thing. Before I pop a blood vessel, let's slow down and go another level deeper by stepping through an example of applying thermodynamics to a circuit component. You ready? When we design something simple like a linear regulator, it's very easy to calculate its efficiency. Let's say we have a linear voltage regulator with a 7 volt input and a 5 volt output, with 500 milliamps passing through. This part, we'll say, is in a TO220 package with no heatsink, just flapping around in the breeze, as some might say. To intentionally misspeak, one watt of electrical energy is lost as heat, and the remaining 2.5 watts are passed into the load. In this case, one watt is converted into heat, and our regulator is 71% efficient. We could say this analysis is done, but instead of just saying that one watt has vaporized into the ether as heat, let's finish these calculations to make sure the linear regulator will actually survive this stress. Oftentimes, the thermal limit of a part will be exceeded well before we approach the electrical limit. Unfortunately, the power dissipated in our circuits doesn't just magically disappear. So let's sketch this system out in a diagram. Let's start with the heat source. This is a small hunk of silicon inside the linear regulator, often called the die. 
This heat is then spread in two directions through two paths. The first one is heat flowing to the PCB through the bond wires and leads of the component. From the PCB, this heat spreads into any plane shapes connected to these pins or through the fiberglass itself. From here, the heat radiates off all these components and the board while also having some energy whisked away off the board through natural convection into the air. If there's a fan nearby, then there may be some forced convection cooling down our PCB even closer to the ambient temperature. What about the other path? Well, heat is also being conducted into the thermal tab of the TO220 package, where it can also be radiated and carried away by forced or free convection. Whoa, 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 we just used a new term without defining it. What is convection anyways? Whenever two objects are in contact, heat is transferred between them. They try to equalize out. When air is one of those things, this gets a little complicated. Why? Because when air gets warmer due to a heat transfer, it expands ever so slightly, causing it to float on top of the air around it due to its decreased density. This action causes the air we heated up to rise, which pulls new cool air against the warm surface. After a while, there ends up being a slight breeze pulled across the warm surface due to this natural thermal expansion. Now this is what we call free convection. Air carrying away energy due to airflow caused by its own thermal expansion. Forced convection forces this airflow to occur. With forced convection, a fan is actively pushing air against the warm surface, causing much more air to come in contact with whatever we're trying to cool down. This in turn can carry a lot more heat away from whatever it is we're cooling, just simply due to the fact that more cold air is coming in contact with the warm surface and carrying energy away. Nothing magic going on here, just averaging out energy. Okay, so it tiny piece of silicon inside the case of our larger regulator is getting hot. This is getting hot because one watt of heat or one joule of energy is being put into the silicon every second. Whoa, wait a minute. We were just talking about watts, an electrical unit, and now we're talking about joules. When did we get into physics class? Well, the simple answer is that we never left. and We never weren't talking about physics. We're just one level deeper into electronics. Now, now that we're all thoroughly confused, what makes this jewel so darn important anyways? Well, we know that we're talking about silicon, a material, and we know it's absorbing one joule of energy per second. What we don't know is how much that matters. However, we can use two material properties to translate watts and joules into how much exactly our part could heat up every second. Density and specific heat are the keys that we need to finish the translation. The density of silicon will tell us how much a small volume of silicon will weigh. We can then approximate the size of the silicon die to get a pretty good estimate. Then we can use the specific heat to translate the weight of silicon into how many joules of energy it takes to heat up a certain amount of silicon by one degree Celsius. Combining these two parameters will tell us how quickly the die or the heart of this component will heat up. Since the average size of the die within a 7805 regulator is probably somewhere around half of a cubed millimeter, this equates to the weight of 0.00116 grams, or about 1.16 milligrams of silicon. The specific heat tells us that for every 0.71 joules of energy that we put into one gram of silicon, the temperature should rise by one degree Celsius. Therefore, our tiny chunk of silicon should increase in temperature by Wait, what? How, 61 degrees? How is that possible? If the die in our part would increase in temperature by 61 degrees every second, that means that we should reach the melting point in silicon in just over 23 seconds. Okay, something doesn't add up here because I've done this before and my 7805 was fine. There is electrical energy in watts coming into the silicon. This causes the silicon to get hot Ah, but that's where the pesky thermal resistance comes in. In the same way that applying a big voltage difference can cause current to flow, applying a big temperature difference across an insulator causes heat to flow. Therefore, as the silicon heats up, the surrounding materials begin to heat up as well, and this transfers heat out of the silicon, away from that die, and into the environment. There's only one exception to this rule. 
time is a critical factor in thinking about thermodynamics in this simplified way because we're always assuming that the system has reached a steady state therefore we're always performing our calculation using average power when designing a circuit it's also possible that a component could dissipate too much power in one instant and if the energy is pumped into the silicon of a component faster than it can begin to spread out through the part now that's when parts start blowing up Sometimes the silicon die can be superheated so extremely that it causes the silicon to sublimate or turn directly from a solid into a gas. This effect builds an incredible quantity of pressure inside component packages, which is how we let out the magic smoke in a loud and glorious display. Great. So our silicon might not melt as long as the average power is close enough to the peak power and how much peak power a component can handle depends on some stuff. Okay, now this might be a stupid question, but how do we know how much heat is flowing out of the die, and how do we know what the peak power limit is for a component? The peak power discussion is way too long to have today, and it depends on what type of component we're talking about. If you're curious about peak or pulse power derating for different components, let us know in the comments or on Twitter. That's a science in itself and we really just don't have time to dive in right now. The first question is easier to answer though. How can we possibly know the thermal resistance from the silicon to our board or to the environment if we can't see how the part was constructed? Let's use an LM7805 linear voltage regulator from TI to continue our example. Searching the 7805 datasheet for thermal resistance brings up three metrics, junction to ambient thermal resistance, junction to case thermal resistance, and junction to thermal pad thermal resistance. The junction to ambient thermal resistance assumes a typical implementation on a PCB, which is whatever the manufacturer decides it is. Typically, this is the component under question connected to one square inch of copper with no other nearby heat sources and free convection only. This parameter tells us how much of a temperature difference we can expect to see between the silicon die and the air when a known quantity of power is flowing through the part. In this case, that number is 19. The temperature of the die will increase by 19 degrees Celsius for every watt flowing out of or through the silicon die, through the package and to the air. Okay, now we know that one watt is being dissipated by the part and at first that heat is all concentrated in the silicon die, causing it to heat up pretty quickly. However, as the die increases in temperature, this heat begins to flow outward away from the silicon and into the surrounding materials. The temperature of the die eventually settles out at some balance point where the heat flowing into the part due to electrical losses is the same as the heat flowing out of a part into the environment. For our 7805, that balance point is when the die is 19 degrees warmer than, huh, th than what? What's our reference temperature? In the case of our junction to ambient thermal resistance, the reference temperature is the temperature of the free air surrounding our component. If the room's 20 degrees Celsius, we would start at 20 and add 19, so the hottest point in our parts junction will be 40 degrees Celsius. If our room's 80 degrees, we still add 19 degrees because one watt is still flowing out of our part. Therefore, the maximum temperature within our part is 100 degrees Celsius. Heat flow is all relative to the ambient temperature of a system or the temperature of the environment surrounding a component. This is where we end up making a, another really strong assumption. And this assumption is that the heat flowing to the environment that surrounds a component doesn't cause the temperature of the environment to increase in a small enclosed space, sometimes that's just not good enough. And that's when professional analysis tools and mechanical engineers need to get involved. You just can't use this steady state basic model when things get complicated. An important thing to recognize in this example is that we only know the final temperature using this model. We don't know how quickly we get to that temperature. We haven't considered how the temperature increase may affect the electrical parameters or the power dissipation of that specific part. We don't know how long the part can operate at this temperature without being damaged. All we know is the maximum temperature of the silicon within our part after everything has reached its balance point. This balance point is commonly known as thermal equilibrium 
or the point where the same amount of heat is flowing both into and out of a component. Thankfully for us, the maximum junction temperature is listed on the data sheets for a component, and if you're dealing with silicon, like most of us are, 125 or 50 degrees Celsius are both pretty common values. We can apply the same principle for the junction to tab thermal resistance, which is 3 degrees Celsius per watt. If we know the maximum heatsink temperature, or assume a maximum heatsink temperature, and trust that we can achieve that with some amount of reasonable airflow, we'll find that our linear regulator can handle a lot more power if we add a heatsink and some forced airflow to the equation. 3 is, after all, a lot smaller than 20, meaning that the hottest part of our regulator will only be 3 degrees hotter than the thermal tab of the regulator if 1 watt is dissipated in the part. If the component tab temperature is approximately equal to the heatsink temperature, then our regulator can't be too much warmer than that, and we could pump a lot of watts into this part before we get up to 125 degrees. The linear regulator is a great example because determining how much power is dissipated in the part is relatively straightforward and it makes the math pretty easy when we want to focus on other parts of the discussion. Thankfully, after we determine the quantity of power dissipated in a part for any component type, the same principles still apply. There's some thermal resistance from whatever is getting hot to the environment and we need to consider that. Almost every component dissipates power if it's on and therefore it's generating heat. This causes every component to be at least a tiny bit warmer than the air around it, and as a good designer, it's our responsibility to recognize when we need to dive into thermal analysis and which components demand that level of scrutiny. Slaving away over every component in a design, now that just won't be a good use of our time, but neglecting thermal design altogether is inexcusable, even if it's entertaining to watch a board get powered on and explode. As long as we're talking about thermal design, I think that we learned a lot about that today. Let's summarize what we've learned. We've learned that heat flows from warm objects to cooler ones. We've learned that we cannot create or destroy energy. We've learned that thermal resistance behaves a lot like electrical resistance, but it's a material property that has to do with thermals instead of electrons. By using a data sheet, we can find the thermal resistances. We get a pretty good idea of how warm a component in our design should get after everything reaches thermal equilibrium, or that thermal balance point. All of this information can be used together to verify that the components in our designs are operating well underneath their thermal limits. This leads to reliable, responsible design, happy customers, and circuits that work well for years to come. Thermal design is a key part of our uninterruptible power supply project. When we're dealing with 700 watts or 700 joules per second, Things can get out of hand really quickly if a component gets in the way. We did thermal analysis on the inverter, step-up switch from a power supply, transformer, hot swap controller, and the PCB itself. With all this thermal analysis complete, we gain confidence that our design can handle the thermal and electrical stresses that come along with 700 watts of power flowing through the system. I hope that you can apply these principles to gain some confidence in your own circuits and more importantly, prevent some parts from flying off the board. If you like what we did today, subscribe to be notified of our future videos where we'll design our DC switch capable of handling 50 amps and start talking about isolation with a crash course a lot like this one. I think that thermo's great. If your head is spinning but you learned something new, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, giving us a shout on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!